Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Square Wave 2. It is 2019, October 2019 and Halloween is just around the corner. So today I'm going to show you something that is appropriate for the Halloween season. It is mysterious. It's kind of spooky and it can be very dangerous. Perfect for Halloween. And here it is, my latest project, a tabletop Tesla coil. It took me about a month to build. Now, when you hear the term Tesla coil, you probably envision a mysterious device shooting forth lightning bolts of electricity into space. Very amusing, fun to play with, very entertaining. But entertainment was not Nikola Tesla's idea when he worked on the coil when he developed it in 1891. What Tesla was trying to accomplish was a way to provide service electricity wirelessly through the air to light up his whole town, his whole country, and eventually to light up the whole world. Free electricity in the air, free for the taking. Now it's easy to show that even the smallest Tesla coil does transmit electricity through the air. All you need is a neon tube. Hold it near an operating Tesla coil and watch it come to life. It lights up brilliantly. And the closer you get, the brighter the tube gets. Now, the uh, parts involved in making the basic Tesla coil are very few. In fact, there are only six components. Let's take a look at the circuit diagram and you can see what I mean. Here is the circuit diagram for the basic Tesla coil. Keep in mind that my coil is a little bit different from this diagram because instead of a single step-up transformer, I'm using two automotive ignition coils wired in parallel. This is the picture of the diagram for a step-up transformer, 120 volts input, output 5,000 volts or more. The symbol for a capacitor, spark gap, primary coil, secondary coil, discharge electrode up here. Now I should point out something about the capacitor diagram here. This is a symbol for a single capacitor, but in practice you're going to have to use a bank of multiple capacitors to get the voltage tolerance and the capacitance you need. But for simplicity, the diagram shows a single capacitor. Down here is the symbol for a ground connection. In case you haven't met him before, this is my shop assistant, Mr. Dillon. He's very useful at keeping the mouse population down here in the shop. When I built my Tesla coil, I used a two-level design, two-layer design. On the top layer, I have a piece of four-inch ABS plastic pipe wound with 10 turns of copper tubing. This is quarter-inch refrigeration copper tubing. Inside here, I have my secondary coil which is made from one and a half inch PVC wound with a thousand turns of magnet wire. My discharge electrode up here on top, I have to admit, I didn't make it. I didn't make it myself. I had to buy it ready-made off of eBay. In the back of my primary coil where you can't see it is my spark gap assembly. Now I put the spark gap here on top to make it accessible because it often has to be adjusted, the size of the gap has to be adjusted. And after every operation, you have to clean the terminals with emery cloth. They corrode very quickly. Now, in order to service or work on the components underneath, I made the top deck removable. I'll take it off for you now so you can see what's inside. My AC line enters the unit back here and goes directly to a standard common household light dimmer switch you get at Home Depot. This is connected to two 20 microfarad run capacitors wired in parallel. What they do is limit the current available to my automotive ignition coils over here. Two of them are wired in parallel. They are wired in parallel to my capacitor bank over here. In the back we have a nice big fan that keeps everything cool. Capacitors especially like to overheat. And in the back here where you can't see are two terminals for wires to connect the bottom deck to the top deck. Once you get your coil up and running, you are going to want to fine tune it. 
for maximum spark output. What we are trying to do is get the primary coil in resonance with the secondary coil, that way ensuring maximum energy transfer from primary to secondary. Now there are two adjustments you can make to do this. The first one is the spark gap, wider or more narrow. This is a very critical adjustment. The next thing you can do is add turns to or subtract turns from your primary coil. Now you may ask, how in the heck am I going to do this? Well, you do it by means of a movable tap on an alligator clip, which I have here. That way you can select any number of turns. Now you can do this process by eye, just by looking for a maximum output, and you can experiment with spark gap and primary coil, and eventually you'll find the combination that puts the unit in tune for maximum output. Or you can do it very scientifically with an oscilloscope and a signal generator. This is more accurate and actually takes less time. But of course it does require some special equipment. Okay, I'm going to dim the lights now and let's see what my coil can do. There are two problems the first time coil builder may encounter. The first one is winding the secondary coil. It's no fun winding hundreds and hundreds of turns of magnet wire on a coil formed by hand the old-fashioned way. It's time consuming, risky, and just no darn fun. So what I have done is design and build my own coil winding jig, and it's adjustable for different size coils. Here's what it looks like. I began the project with a trip to Home Depot to buy a length of quarter inch threaded rod. I also bought a few nuts and a few washers to match the rod. Everything else here is just made from scrap lumber I had around the shop. I made two verticals out of scrap lumber. I cut two pieces of masonite to make what I call pressure plates. And over here I designed a little crank out of a piece of scrap metal and a big long bolt. What you are going to do is take your coil form and clamp it securely between the pressure plates by tightening up the two nuts on the outside of the pressure plates. Once your coil form is secure and centered, you are ready to start winding. Now this jig is adjustable for different lengths of coil, simply by sliding the verticals apart or pushing them together. Now you could bolt your verticals to your workbench, you could clamp them to the workbench, or you could do what I do and secure them with just two heavy weights. That way it's easy to set up the jig in another part of the shop or another part of the workbench. Begin by punching a pinhole near the end of your coil form. After you secure the wire with a piece of tape, you are ready to start winding. One. Make sure you keep a constant tension on your wire as it approaches the form. You may have to stop once in a while and make corrections if the coils tend to separate. Now if you have to stop for some reason and take a break, take a piece of electrical tape to secure your work. When you come back at some later time, remove the tape and you are ready to continue. Now let's say you've reached the end of your coil. Secure your work with electrical tape. 
Take some glue or cement and make a few spots of cement over the last two or three turns. It's a good idea to put some at the beginning, too. And that's how the coil winding jig works. The second difficulty the new Tesla coil builder may encounter is finding capacitors, affordable capacitors, with a high enough voltage reading and a high enough value in microfarads. These tend to be hard to find, and when you do find them, they're very expensive. Fortunately, I came across a vendor on eBay called Apex Junior. Apex Junior, supplier of electronic parts, mostly surplus. What he had was a little disk capacitor rated at 25 kilovolts, 25,000 volts, and rated at 0.005 microfarads. This was absolutely perfect for me, and they didn't cost very much either. So I combined them in series and parallel to get the voltage tolerance and the capacitance I needed. They work beautifully. Again, I can highly recommend Apex Junior. Find him on eBay. Now, a final word about safety and dealing with high voltage. High voltage is dangerous, and you have to take certain precautions. I do. For instance, whenever I'm operating my Tesla coil or adjusting it, I'm sitting on a wooden stool with wooden legs, and my feet are far above the concrete shop floor. This way, if I touch something I shouldn't, I'm not going to be electrocuted. As a further safety, all the outlets in my shop go through a common ground fault detector, which I have inadvertently tripped many times while adjusting my Tesla coil. Well, that's it for the October project. Mr. Dillon and I thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.